2 Corinthians chapter 8 is where we will be today, eventually, but not right off the bat. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Today is the fifth time that I am coming before the church with a stewardship message in this series. And today is when we will actually begin to get into the nitty gritty part of the questions about money. And since every one of us does business and carries on commerce and relies upon having and using money as a means of exchange, all of us should be taking an interest in anything that we can find in the Scriptures as we were just reminded how important it is that we come into the Scriptures so that we can get the guidance that we need so we will learn the right way to acquire, to use, to save, and to give money. And fortunately, the Lord has not left us in the dark on this issue. We don't have to sit around and imagine the best ways to do these things because God has given us some light on that. And just as the psalmist says, we should not be leaning on our own understanding, certainly in this important part of our lives. And decisions making uh, should come as a result of a trust in the Lord for His direction. And in fact, our Wednesday Bible studies in Psalm 119 have repeatedly made the point that God's words, His commands, His precepts, His judgments, His instruction, all of these are to be valued at least as highly and as and generally much more so than we would value any silver or gold that we possess, which is what money was whenever you think about the, uh, the time of the scriptures and whenever wealth was measured in gold and silver rather than using a paper script. Something occurred to me when I was doing some study on, the, on this for this message, and that is that gold and silver are part of God's creation. They're elements found in the earth. We can't create gold. We can't not create silver. We can mine it. We can dig it out. We can refine it and out of the ore that we get out of it. But those elements were placed there by God in the earth. And in the authorized version of the Bible, gold is mentioned 417 times, silver is mentioned 320 times, and the word money is mentioned 140 times, but never in the sense of currency or paper script the way that we think of it. The tabernacle in the wilderness was built as a result of a gift that came from the people of God who had just left Egypt. And that tabernacle had in it about a ton of gold and about three times that in silver in its structure. And then that by the time of the building of Solomon's temple, there was many, many more times than that. Some 3,000 tons of gold were involved in the building of Solomon's temple, according to records. And even the future New Jerusalem is described as having a great street of gold in the book of Revelation chapter 21. And yet, despite the comparative rarity of silver and gold, there is a finite amount out there that accounts somewhat for its value. And since it is a part of creation and it's already been created and no more is being created at this time, and despite its beauty and its luster and its resistance to oxidation, the psalmist repeatedly says things like this in Psalm 19, for instance. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. And in Psalm 119, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver in verse 72. In verse 127 of the same psalm, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. And in a less specific way, the psalmist declares in 119, verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. So there's our guidance right there. We have things to do with money. We have things to do with silver and gold, which is another way of describing money. And in instances where we are told to put a comparative value on those things, We're always supposed to be looking for God for direction in order to get that perspective. 
Now, all these scriptures taken together tell us at the very least we need to gain some sort of perspective on how we view our money. Some days, surprisingly, money barely enters my thinking. That's usually because I have money on those days. Other days, money, or usually the shortage of money, occupies our thinking a lot. It's all we can think about. And there have been times when I had more money than I do right now. And there have been times when I had less money than I have right now, far less. Generally speaking, I prefer having money over not having it. And I think most of us here do. Learning the lesson in the book of Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13 is not an easy one. Paul says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now I'd like to square off here and just use this as a text to preach from. And uh, there, are, there are two or three good points here we could, we could really bang hard on, I think. It, but it, I'm, I'm not ready to do that kind of banging just quite yet. In fact, I haven't even gotten around to dealing with the main text yet. If you may, may have noticed, I haven't read it yet. But I will say this. Verse 12 lets us in on a piece of information that I don't think everybody understands. Certainly many have not been made aware of it. And here it is. When Paul says, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, he is saying to us and revealing to us that inequality is actually part of God's design. It is actually His design for you to sometimes have more and to sometimes have less. And for some people to have more and for some people to have less. Inequality is part of that design. It's not happen chance. And you'll, you'll see this a little bit better later on. Jesus spoke a parable where I think he, He's illustrating this point where he describes a scene where a master is distributing money to his servants. And he's going to give one servant five talents, and talents here has to do with the weight of, of silver or gold, and to another two, and to another one one. Now he could have added another talent to it and given all three of them three each. But he didn't do that. And I think again, this is kind of Jesus here wants us to understand that the master in this parable, in some sense, is God the Father. And the master gives one servant five talents, another one two, and another one one. Now, what is clear here is that God has given talents, and I mean money in that sense. But I think you could say the same thing of spiritual gifts. We don't all have the same spiritual gifts. We don't have, all have the same natural talents and abilities. And I'm thinking in terms of natural abilities when I use the word talent there. We don't all have the same amount of physical resources. These have all been distributed unequally. Now, do you believe God is just? The scriptures declare so. My experience says so. God is just and so... I conclude that it is not inherently unjust for some to have more talents, for some to have more money, for some to have more gifts than others. That's not unjust of God. He's the giver of gifts. Paul says in another place, what do you have that was not given to you? And if it was given to you by God, and God has chosen to give you that, There has to be an inequality. And you cannot accuse God of injustice on this point. As His servants then, we are to receive humbly what God has given us. 
not begrudging those who have more, and not disdaining those who have less. You see, even though God is just and not unjust, we can often be unjust ourselves. And we can think badly about people who have more than we have, or who have less than we have, and treat them in an unjust way. Some days you're going to have more than others, and some days you're going to have less than others. And some days you'll have less or more than you do today. And in all of these ups and downs, according to these scriptures, the book of Philippians chapter 4, in all of these ups and downs, in all of this unequal distribution, there are two goals that the apostle says that we are, need to be aware of, that God is trying to work out in our lives. One of them is we need to learn the value of contentment. We need to learn that. It doesn't come naturally. We tend not to be content. I dare say that infants tend not to be content all the time. It's lovely when they are. They're angelic when they are content, but they're sometimes not content. And toddlers are not always content. Other children are not always content. And you know what? I don't think we ever actually outgrow it. We might edit ourselves a little bit so that we don't show it as much, but we tend to be discontented. And so part of what God is doing as He's distributing these things, resources, talents, gifts, call them what you will, the Apostle Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. It doesn't come naturally. It's something that you have to learn. And then the second thing is found down there in verse 13. Possibly the most often out of context quoted verse in the whole Bible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Strengthens? Haven't we been talking about that lately? Christ strengthens us so that we are able to be content. So that we are able to learn how to use our money so that we are able to adjust ourselves to what God has placed in our hands or has not placed in our hands, whatever the case may be. So these are two goals. God wants us to learn to be content, and He wants us to grab onto the strength of Christ to make that possible. Now, there's a third goal, but I don't think it's revealed here. It's just sort of hinted at. And the third goal is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And so now we're going to get there. And in the spirit of Pastor Al, who is not here today, I'm going to read the whole chapter. What do you think about that? He would, right? Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record. Yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. This they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, 
That is, there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Now we're going to spend a little more time on that verse here in a minute because of what I said about inequality a minute ago. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, which puts the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not that only, but all who also was chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oft times proved diligently and many, diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Where our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches in the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show you to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. Now, we've been in this chapter before, but it was several months ago when I first started this series and then we only used the first several verses of it. To summarize, the apostle in this chapter commends a group of churches who, though they were relatively poor themselves, were giving toward a relief project in a big way. You see, what he's doing in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians is he's actually doing a fundraising right here. And he's telling the Corinthians, you guys need to get on the stick. You made some promises last year. You really talked big. But now it's up to you. You're going to have to really, really do it now and take care of it. And this isn't the last time he mentions this, in this in, uh, to, to the Corinthians, by the way. He said, but this is, what you guys, this is what you guys need to go ahead and do. And he says, Titus is there with you, and, uh, and he's there ready to receive the offering, and I've sent some others along the way, and we're keeping an eye on each other so that everything is being honest and above board. But the main thing he's trying to get the Corinthians to understand is, that these Macedonian people, who weren't all all that far away from Corinth, they had learned that people in a region far away from them had a great financial need. The Christian believers in Jerusalem had undergone great persecution, had found themselves in huge poverty, losses of jobs, losses of livelihoods, losses of property and so on because of their newfound belief in Christ. And so the Macedonians, Gentiles, pagans in the minds of some of those people in Jerusalem have now begun to take up these offerings and start sending money back into Jerusalem for that. And that's what chapter 8 is all about here. But the way that the Macedonians went about giving it, Paul actually acts as though he was taken aback. He says, they gave not as we hoped. These people really dug down deep. They didn't have any money, and yet they found money and gave out of their poverty. We're very, very liberal. Liberal is a good word when you use it right, by the way. And the only explanation that Paul can give for what he had experienced among the Macedonians was this was the result of a massive amount of grace taking place in their lives that they had been showered with grace. God had backed up a dump truck upon them and had just dumped a load of grace on these people and has made them do what they are now doing and to the human eyes around them and said they could not possibly do, but you can do all things through Christ and His strength. And that is in context here. Grace in the gospel that saved them 
and an ongoing grace that's apparent in their lives has made them able to give seemingly impossible amounts of money. And that's what he means when he talks about how the grace of God has been bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now I should point out these churches of Macedonia. As I said, they're in Greece. They're not all that far from Corinth. And they're helping, this, the, helping people in Jerusalem. And I think it would be fair to say that those Christian believers in Jerusalem, some of them are probably still hanging on to some old anti-Greek notions, you know? Uh, they might have been suspicious of this gift from people who had just so recently been pulled out of paganism. Paul, in fact, says as much when he writes to the Romans about the very same issue. And he says, we're on our way to Jerusalem right now with the gift. He's writing the Romans and he said to them, we're on our way to Jerusalem right now with the gift that has been given by the Gentile churches. And he says, pray. Pray that the saints in Jerusalem will receive the gift. You think... Well, why wouldn't they receive it? It's free money, right? It came from Gentiles. It's tainted in the minds of many there. And so he says, pray. You know, it takes grace to give, but sometimes it also takes grace to receive. And so he prays. Ask them to pray because there's a chance they won't receive it. Didn't matter to the Macedonians. It was a moot point. They had a willingness to meet the need however and wherever and whoever it might be. Now, here's where we see, I think, the heart of this whole money matter when we get into stewardship. And the thing that ought to grip us when we're trying to get a handle on stewardship, we already know the importance of grace in these things. The word occurs five times in this chapter, four times before we get to verse 9. And remember that the Greek word for gift and grace are the same word, charis. In my first message, in addition to using the first part of this chapter as my text, I also said there that the gospel has a tendency to create stewards. Now you may not have fully understood what I meant by that, but I think this chapter of 2 Corinthians 8 will explain that to you. Believing the gospel is so much more than just changing your eternal destination from hell to heaven or by making a single decision to accept the Lord, which is the language we often use to describe that act. When you believe the gospel, though, it transforms not only your relationship to God, but your relationship to everything else, including money. What is the heart of the money matter? For a believer in Christ, it is found in the very actions of Christ Himself as described in this chapter. Verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. Now remember what I said before about how inequality is part of God's design? This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. It may have sounded off to you. And I, and I have to admit, the first time I read and, and, and heard somebody say that, I thought, what in the world? But this is a perfect example of what we're talking about here. The gospel is designed to take advantage of that very inequality. Without that inequality, the gospel really wouldn't be all that effective, especially in the realm of the spiritual. Men and women, men and women, Growing up, natural born men, women in this, in this world here, if they could approach God in their natural state, even if they could approach God in their natural state, they'd have nothing to bring in their hands to Him, would they? Nothing. There's nothing we can bring to God. You say, well, we could do some righteous things, maybe, and that might impress God. No, Isaiah says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Yeah, but surely we could do something good, and God would take note of that. There is none righteous, no, not one. 
There's not a just man upon the earth that does good and sins not, according to the Scriptures. When it comes to our ability to impress God, inequality kicks in. We are dirt poor, to put it in oaky terms. We have nothing to bring to God. And so even if we could approach God on our own, which we don't, even if we could, we would have to come totally empty-handed. Christ, on the other hand, because of the inequality, we're dirt poor, Christ is rich. Rich in righteousness, rich in so far as the Father says, I am well pleased with my Son. He's not pleased with us, He's pleased with His Son. And that is the inequality. We have nothing, Christ has everything. What does grace do in that situation? The gospel springs into action so that Christ, though He was rich, becomes poor on our behalf so that we now who are poor become rich. And that's how the gospel creates stewards. Knowing what God has done for us through the gospel by giving us the riches in Christ when we had nothing in ourselves we translate that spirit and grace of Christ into our own lives, much as the Macedonians did. That's the reason why Paul said, I want you to look at the grace, how it's been bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. The gospel has really taken hold on these people here. Now he wants that to kind of go toward the Corinthians. And he says, here's the deal, Corinthian church. In verse 13, I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened. He's still taking note of that inequality here, you see. But by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Paul's thinking is the Jerusalem church is dirt poor, Corinthian church got stuff, they transfer it. And he says there needs to be an equality here. Remember back a couple of three months ago when I was talking about uh, creation stewardship? And I said one of the things that, uh, that surprised me as I was going through it and thinking about, uh, about creation and relationship to stewardship is how that God created a perfect world, but there is still stuff left to do. And we do that. God creates inequalities for us to fix. Think about that for a minute. Here's a situation. There's an inequality. Jerusalem, couldn't God, let me ask you this, could not God just suddenly make gold appear in the households of these people in Jerusalem if that's what He wanted to do? God's no counterfeiter. He could put real gold in there if He wanted to do that. He obviously has given the Corinthians something and the Jerusalem church is poor, why doesn't he just say, Jerusalem, you can be rich just like these people can be rich? At this time, your abundance may be a supply for their want. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want. That there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no luck. Now, hang on to your seats. Remember what Paul had said to the Philippians? There will be times of lack, and there will be times of abundance. And I said that there were two goals in that passage there. One of them was that we would learn contentment, and two, that we would gain and lean into the strength of Christ as a result of our need. Here's the third goal that's related to the ups and downs. The ups and downs are designed so that believers may meet one another's needs. God could, if He wanted to, at the Friday every week, could give us all exactly the same paycheck, if that's what He wanted to do. But He didn't do that. He gave Joe way, way, way more money than I get. I can tell you that. I'm kidding, I have no idea what Joel makes, but I bet it's a lot. 
And remember I said there have been times when I had more money than I do now? I go on Medicare in another two weeks. I've been kind of walking sideways into retirement now for about the last two and a half years. I miss having a company credit card. I really do. And having a company car, all those things, all those nice things. But you know what? I've learned how to be content to do without those things. The inequalities and the ups and downs in our lives are designed so that we can be a blessing to one another and be a help to one another. Not only financially, but also emotionally, spiritually. That is the thinking when Paul tells the Corinthians, he says that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want. And at first it sounds like he's saying, you know, you're going to take care of these people today, and then maybe sometime in the future, maybe they'll be taking care of you. I've always read that verse that way. And that's one of the, it's, 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 it's a valid way of thinking about it, I think. What Paul may be speaking of is that all of us at some time or another are going to be on the receiving end of stewardship, and all of us are going to be on the giving end of stewardship at some time or another. And perhaps he was thinking that at some future point the now poverty-stricken ones in Jerusalem will have resources and they will be able to repay the Corinthians for their kindnesses and the Macedonians as well. And I think the gospel creates that mindset. It, it fits with the ups and downs and the inequalities and things. But one of the things I said many months ago when I first started the stewardship series was one of the most reliable evidences of conversion takes place as you watch a person stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about other people. That's a pretty reliable indicator that the gospel's really taken hold of somebody. And as they begin to look for ways to use time and talent and treasure for others and for the work of the gospel, we begin to say these people are truly converted. Their schedule belongs to God. Their clock belongs to God. They get real pleasure by giving to the needs of others and to the ministry. And we know, and we ought to be getting pleasure from it, knowing that your dollars and efforts will help others hear the gospel and will come to Christ. I, felt, I, had a, I got a real pleasure. I got a real joy just a couple of weeks ago to be able to hand Prem when he was here. Just a, a little extra money above what the church was giving. I, I didn't, didn't miss it a bit, and I, I got a lot out of it just, just doing that. And I've, I've done that, done that many, many times before, and I get a real kick out of doing that. When the gospel creates a steward, that steward will begin to agree with the Apostle Paul who wrote, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. That's part of what the gospel does to a person. But it occurred to me when I was working on this sermon that it may not be may not be that God, Paul is speaking here of a quid pro quo system where you help me, then later on I help you. What if he's speaking of the Jerusalem saints being in need at this time and receiving both the gift of the Macedonians before and now the Corinthians going forward? What if the abundance they were be giving, what if the abundance they were giving at that moment the abundance that Jer Jerusalem had an abundance of poverty. That's what they had. What if, what if that's the abundance that Paul is talking about? He says, you know, Jerusalem is giving you an abundance of poverty. And you're giving them abundance of resources at the same time. We're not talking about something in the future. They're giving you an abundance of opportunity to do good work. Now think about that for a minute. What if the abundance they were giving at that moment was providing the opportunity for the Macedonians to build yet more grace into their lives? When Paul's walking away from this situation and he thinks about what took place up in Macedonia and he thinks about what's going to take place here in Corinth if they do what they say they're going to do and then 
as he finishes this journey of his and he goes to Jerusalem and he deposits all this money from the Gentile churches and he presents it to those elders there in Jerusalem at the church there. He says, I want you to know your brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the Gentile world have dug down deep and they've seen the grace of God work in their lives and here they want to present you with this gift. As Paul walks away from that situation, leaving the Jerusalem church with the money, and then looking back at what took place in Macedonia and Corinth and the other Gentile churches, who do you think Paul believes has the greatest blessing of God on their lives? You know as well as I do. It's great to receive a gift, but how much better is it to be able to give a gift? The abundance that Jerusalem is giving to Macedonia and Corinth is an abundance of need and an abundance of opportunity for them to meet that need. In Jerusalem, the poor people will receive money, but that's all they're going to get at this point. And good wishes, of course. But in Macedonia and in Corinth, they'll be filled with the grace of God through this experience. And so Paul tells the Corinthians at the top of this chapter, we want you to know about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. It makes sense. We don't have it recorded in the Gospels, but it is spoken of in the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul says, one of the things the Lord Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So as Paul walks away from the situation, who do you think he believes is the better off? This is true of the Macedonians. It will be true of the Corinthians if they follow through. The ultimate giver, of course, is God himself who gave His only begotten Son, the most precious thing He could give, so that whoever believes on Him would not perish but have everlasting life. And a God who gives like that will impart all the strength and the grace of Christ necessary to those of us who believe so that we can become givers who imitate our Lord. Our Father, we are thankful today for the Word. We're thankful today for the good examples given to us by the Apostle. We're grateful for the instruction. Help us now to find it true in our own lives to be more blessed to give than to receive. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.